Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In today's episode, we have a lot of smaller hodgepodge type of things to do. And such a wide range of things that I don't even know what I'm going to call this episode. Maybe just more stuff? To start off with, though, we're putting in our power spine. It's going to connect directly to our steam room, which we also have to get in and modify, but more on that in a few minutes. Now, I thought about this in a few different ways. We could actually bore all the way up and build in the heavy watt wire as we go, but I didn't want to keep dropping ice all the way down. So instead, we're going to be building it in from the side. And then we have an automatic dispenser sitting over here by our metal refinery reservoir that is set to collect all the ice, polluted ice, and snow. It'll drop right down here where the dupes have no access to it. And it's a good thing too because we've started using this polluted water here. You'll notice that we have a new water sieve here. We're collecting all the excess water that comes out from the metal refinery. Any water that the metal refinery doesn't use goes right over into the water sieve. From there, it takes the long trip all the way to our main water tank. And the reason why we're doing that is because this tank is getting dangerously low. Now, I'm not 100% worried about water in the long term because we have a lot of ice biomes that are still going to melt and provide a lot of water. Just in this screen right here, there's three biomes. Granted, this one's much larger, but we also have this massive biome too. Hence the reason that we're building a wall as we dig in, so that way none of the water escapes when the ice eventually melts. There's also two large biomes over here too. In fact, one of them has a geyser that we can't wait to take a look at. We've almost dug out the necessary tiles. Additionally, on today's episode, as I was saying, we need to get into this steam room. To start, the thermo aqua tuner's taken a little bit of damage when there just wasn't enough steam pressure in here to absorb the heat that the thermo aqua tuner was producing. Additionally, we're going to add some automation. We want to make sure that the conveyor rail is going to go around, and if the igneous rock still has heat on it, well, then we want to wrap all the way back around so we can start the loop all over again. These steam turbines have been running this smart battery for several cycles now, and the igneous rock is still sitting at 170 degrees. We'll probably keep the igneous rock in here until it gets down to about 130. And then finally, we need to talk about food a little bit. We're down to 44 tons of dirt. Now, I know what you're thinking. There should still be plenty of dirt left on this planetoid. Well, here's the zoom out. There's not that much. The biggest concentration of it is actually on the very top of the planetoid in the vacuum of space. You'll see it's somewhat speckled in here. Now, it's not all bad news. You can see that we have a rather large backstock of pickled meal. Now, I say rather large, but to tell you the truth, 260,000 calories of pickled meal would only feed these dupes for about three and a half cycles. But the reason why all that pickled meal is in back stock is because, well, we have this ranch here, all the starvation farm being done here, and these two ranches here providing us with some nice barbecue. And of course, the duplicates would rather eat the barbecue, then they'd eat the fried mushrooms, and then they'd eat the pickled meal. And for those of you who do not know, the consumables menu will kind of explain to you in which order they'll eat everything. First of all, they do not need to be eating meat. Let's go ahead and uncheck that. Long story short, they're going to go from the far right of this menu all the way to the far left. With the least desirable thing that they'll eat, in other words, the thing that they choose to eat very last, being meal lice. Now, there are mods that you can adjust which foods that the dupe will eat first. But it's actually good that the meal lice is the last thing they choose to eat. And that's simply because the meal lice inside of a refrigerator lasts the absolute longest out of all of our food. But to the point at hand, we're down to about 44 tons of dirt. That's not going to last very long when you're running as much mealwood as we are. Well, that brings us to our dust caps, where we only have 25 tons of slime left. But I'm actually feeling more optimistic about the slime levels because there's plenty of biomes left that have plenty of slime. All in all, I count three or four of them that I can see on the map right now. But just in case, we have a backup plan. Ladies and gentlemen, the Paku Plank Jr. Now this is a modification on a larger design that I've had a couple of other videos on. I highly suggest you go check those out. Long story short, this container here will hold three Paku. Whenever they lay an egg, which is pretty often considering how fast a Paku lays an egg. With the 67% reproduction rate per cycle, they're laying one egg in under two cycles. But whenever they lay that egg, this auto sweeper picks it up and throws it right into this conveyor loader. We have a solid filter here that decides, hey, is this a regular Paku fry egg or is this an another type of egg? If it's a fry egg, it gets sent down this way to the regular Paku plank system. 
If it's not a fry egg, it comes down here to the extras. That will all end up inside the infinite Paku pond. Right now you can see that this mechanized airlock is closed because there's not three Paku in here. So when this fry egg hatches, it's going to bounce all the way over and into our beautiful pool. If there are enough eggs in the breeding tank, this door is going to open and all of these Paku are going to drop down in the pool just like all these extras. Any fish fillets or eggshells that happen to come out in here will get picked up by this auto sweeper and dumped right here back into this tank where this auto sweeper will put it into one of two conveyor loaders. One conveyor loader just puts it to the outside and drops it through a conveyor chute for a dupe to come handle. The other conveyor rail, well, it goes on for a minute, all the way up to our kitchen where it gets dropped off right here, where eventually one of our many cooks will cook it up into some cooked fish. And not only does the cooked fish give us 600 more calories in the Paku filet, it also gives us a little bit of radiation resistance. Now, I decided on doing this method because right now, it's the only sustainable source of food that we have access to. We can keep feeding three Paku, about a million mealwood seeds that we already have, for a very, very long time. Now, eventually, somewhere in this geyser, there may be an ample amount of water or another sort of geyser that'll give us access to something else that we can then turn into food, but right now... Pickings are slim. The first dupe up for this episode is an uncultured farmer who doesn't know what a hammer or a saw is. Welcome to dupe number 70, Whiskey T Fox. Our next dupe is going into a lot of tidying business, but they also make a pretty good doctor. They have an interest in doctoring and they're a caregiver. Only negative is they have an irritable bowel. Welcome to dupe number 71, Jaws Tech. Our next dupe is finally another dupe that can do some digging and constructing. They're not much of a dresser, but they are candy and they have an iron gut. Welcome to dupe number 72, Artemon Strick. So to actually get to work on this episode, yeah, we have some dupes putting in the power spine. We need to find a way to get into the steam room. It's going to have to be in suits because it's 160 degrees. The problem is our old liquid lock is not going to work. The only liquids that we have access to right now are salt water, polluted water, and regular water which will all flash in 160 degree temperatures, which means we need to get our hands on some of this beautiful oil. The oil will allow us to set up a proper liquid lock where we can get in here and start doing some repairs and some upgrades to this whole system. I think we're actually gonna start by draining this water here. This is all the collection of water that has just so happened to have formed since we started building this huge shaft. We're gonna do that just by digging into here just a little bit. It'll allow the water to drain and it'll start the process of melting this whole biome. And then I think we'll be able to set up some sort of dock system here and then break in. Now we don't need to be too gingerly with any sort of liquid lock or anything because yeah, we need to be in the Atmos suits, but it's not so hot that it's gonna cause a problem for the rest of our colony. After all, it only gets up to about 80 degrees here. Oh look, there's a neutronium patch in here. Chances are it's a volcano, but it'd be really nice if it wasn't. Now, in an effort to be able to dig down there and construct things down there, we've had to extend down our gas pipes. For the first reason, we're going to need some way to fill up Atmo suits. The second is we still have been having that problem where this shaft is just too far along and dupes get trapped in this cycle of having to come back, pick things up. They travel half the ladder, then drop it because they need air. So we've added a couple of gas vents around here, and we've also added these makeshift mesh tiles here. And this way, if they do drop something from the main part of the base, it only drops down to these mesh tiles instead of all the way down here in this pool. Additionally, we're also digging this area out. Now this is for a separate reason. We're gonna drop all of this ice down in here because we need to build something here. And I'm hoping to be able to show you what we're gonna be building there a little later on in this episode. So we learned what this next geyser is, and oh boy, it's another chlorine gas vent. I was just thinking in my bed last night, man, how am I going to get this colony to survive to 150 dupes? I snapped my fingers and said, that's it. I need more chlorine. I've learned that whenever you're doing a large project like this, in this case, as you know, we need to get rid of this area, but I figured it'd be nice to kind of combine it with this area, you know, to keep the chlorine gas vent company. But the dupes are so slow and they take so long to figure out what they want to do that they end up suffocating a lot. So that's why we've started traveling with these little guys. Just a quick manual generator, a jumbo battery, and an oxygen diffuser. 
Now we don't have a lot of algae, but it at least will provide a little bit of oxygen, for instance, when Skadavi can't catch their breath. It allows them to be able to run someplace local to catch their breath, for instance in this great meetup location, instead of all the way up here where the closest vent is. Small update on the Plank Jr. I had completely forgotten when I add these couple of tiles that I needed to make sure that this room was at least eight tiles in size. See, now that we have the perfect eight tiles, the Paku down here are only overcrowded and not cramped, which is a key. What was originally a Travaldo is a pretty good farmer with agriculture and a green thumb. They've got an iron gut. They're not too fond of the machinery. Welcome to the colony, dupe number 73, Highborn Jace. Our next dupe, we kind of got lucky. There's suit wearing, supplying expert with quick learning and gourmet, and their only negative is a small bladder. Ladies and gentlemen, a dupe after my own heart. Dupe number 74, Beer Killer. I really hope we have a huge agriculture set up in the future because our next dupe is really good at farming too. And it seems like we have a lot of farmers. Not only are they good at farming, they also have an iron gut and they're a grease monkey. Ladies and gentlemen, dupe number 75, iHoss05. Sometimes it's funny just watching the dupes and seeing how long it takes them to figure out their next command. It's even more funny when they can't breathe. Like in this case of dupe number 57, Kira. Let's see how long we wait. Yep, we're still digging. That's a good job. We're going to let the water drain, but then we're going to contemplate life here underwater. Oh, yep, my eyes itch. Don't know what I'm going to do quite next. Oh, let's go further down. It's a little chilly down here, but I'll just keep holding my breath. I haven't been kidding in the last few episodes that it's always Travis. I don't know what it is, but Travis just loves to go to the places where he knows he can't breathe and that there's no escape from certain death. In this case, we can save Travis by the good placement of just one granite ladder. Why granite? Well, because there's granite sitting right next to it. We'll put a high priority on that and, you know, save Travis's life again. It's what we do, people. We've saved dupe lives around here. We don't put them at risk at all. Like seriously, I don't think people want to save Travis because they just keep walking by the ladder. No big deal. Travis is catching a nap in carbon dioxide. It's a brisk minus 30, but it's okay. Oh, Sushri. And then we have Sushri, who I believe invented the teleporter and then teleported all the way over here. Now somehow we need to save Sushri. I'm sure it was some digging issues and instead of going west back home, Sushri decided they wanted to go check out the Pinch of Peppa plant. Let's see if we can save Sushri's life. And it looks like Sushri is going to save their own life. All right, it looks like we finally got all this water drained into this nice little area here. We're a little pool with the rest of the ice as it melts. We even sealed it off to make sure that none of the cold escapes out here. And now I think we're ready to start putting in a few Atmosuit docks. Now this was going to be an issue the entire time because remember, we're only building Atmosuit docks where we actually need them. In this case, there's just not a lot of room for Atmosuits. So I think we're going to go with five. We'll be able to put a checkpoint right here and, and still not let this hydrogen go. And then we can slowly start digging down in through here. I already have the gas pipe ran. And now we're just going to need a little bit of power. We have a circuit pretty far down the shaft already. So we'll just continue it on. And then we're almost ready. Now for right now, our whole purpose coming down here is going to be to sweep up some of this crude oil. Now this here is way too much to be able to mop up. But with a little bit of ingenuity, we may be able to drop some of this and be able to mop up the rest. Of course, there's this giant pool down here. We could just put a liquid pump down there. Now we just got to create five more suits to go in those docks. And I had to show you that we've got 189 reed fiber units on top of 11.1 .1 tons of plastic. Thank you, Drekos. Speaking of which, I think it's high in time that we actually start installing some plastic ladders. The big difference between regular ladders and plastic ladders is plastic ladders give you plus 20% of run speed. That is incredibly important with the long distances these folks are running. And if you're wondering how much 11 tons will get us, well, we started here and we ended all the way down here. That was 11 tons worth of plastic. Not too bad. Now for that 20% run speed trade-off, the thing that you have to worry about the most is the melting point. The plastic ladders melt at 159.9 degrees. Needless to say, it's not even going to come close to getting that warm. Still, it's an important trade-off to think of. While the dupes are busy working on that tunnel some more, we've finished our power spine so we can actually now connect into it. Same setup as before, all the steam turbines are connected to one smart battery and they're connected to the spine. 
Well, the good news is we finally have reached the magma. I've also decided we're just going to put a quick pitcher pump in here. It's going to be nice and easy. We have a few patches of neutronium to try out too. One here, one over here, and then one over here. Please ignore the continuous suffocation messages. We're also taking the opportunity to dig out all the diamond we find, even a little bit of fossil. Oh, look at this is another neutronium patch. Now, theory goes is that most neutronium patches in this biome are going to be volcanoes. But I've also seen water geysers down here too. Now, I did go around and check for abyssalite breaks. I didn't see any of concern. The only one that's close is right here. And there's still a one tile buffer to protect us. And it's an end of an era for our small little power plant here. It served us really well. And based on the fact that we're only running two hatch ranches and we only have four tons of coal left, this power control station came in handy. And this entire colony is being ran off of these four steam turbines. It is such an incredible amount of power. Our next dupe is a cooking, rocketry, and ranching expert with mole hands and interior decorator. Plenty of good positive traits, all for the cost of only being a pacifist and a shabby dresser. Welcome to the colony dupe number 76, Oxotrophic. Our next dupe is a slow learning, plant murdering, mole hand using, tidier builder. And yes, this was the best dupe that I had available. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the colony dupe number 77, Maximilian Hinchy. Our next dupes are ranching, farming, building extraordinaire. A little bit of yokel, but they're gourmet and interior decorator as well. Welcome to dupe number 78, Mashby Bot. So all bad ideas have to start from somewhere, and this is where this journey begins. We're going to make a quasi-liquid lock using one resource that will not flash as soon as it hits 140 degrees steam. And that just so happens to be crude oil. Our little system down here is working out well. Dupes can hit these Atmos suit docks and then they enter in through here. We could have just mopped some up and then I realized, no, why don't we just put a pitcher pump in here? Oh yeah, by the way, this is a cobalt volcano. Good for us to have refined cobalt and all, but still isn't water. And now we're just going to take the crude oil. We're going to put some in this bottle empty here, enable the auto bottle. And then when the oil is dropped off, it'll fill this one spot. We can then dig into this abyssalite, deconstruct this tile, this tile, and this tile and we'll have ourselves a perfectly sealed liquid lock. Remember I told you there was a few patches of neutronium to investigate? In addition to the cobalt volcano, we've also unearthed a regular volcano, an iron volcano, and at last, a regular steam vent. Now, regular steam vents are pretty good in the fact that they're going to produce a lot of steam, which we can then pull down into water. The disadvantage being it's at 500 degrees. Here comes our oil delivery now. In goes the beautiful crude oil. One thing we definitely got lucky with in this playthrough is pretty easy access to crude oil that's sitting at 61 degrees. And now we've deconstructed both of these tiles. And when we deconstruct this tile, we'll be left with crude oil here, here, and here. And we'll have a nice little vacuum in this tile here, just like that. Last thing to do is put in the Atmos suit checkpoint, and then we'll be able to come over here, deconstruct a couple insulated tiles, and get to work finalizing our setup in here. Our next dupe has some weird issues. They have an iron gut, yet they still have an irritable bowel. They're handy, shriveled taste buds. They specialize in decorating and building, and we will add their consciousness to our own. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to dupe number 79, Cloud. Our next dupe is a starry-eyed plant murderer who enjoys tidying, building, and supplying. Welcome to dupe number 80, Mr. Daxonin. Our next dupe is a quick learner with critter version. They can do ranching, decorating, and doctoring. Yep, it's a rancher with critter version. Welcome to dupe number 81, so lucky 88. Here is our new and improved steam power room complete with automation and temperature regulation. It all starts with this conveyor meter. Shout out to the comments for reminding me that we even had a conveyor meter. And in this instance, it's going to work perfect for this system. The long and short is the igneous rock is going to start off with these conveyor loaders. And it's going to come across these rails. It's going to go up and around until 15 units go through it. I'll explain the 15 units in a minute. But those 15 units will then continue on, go all the way up through here until they hit this thermo sensor. Thermo sensor says, hey, if you're below 130 degrees, you can pass through the conveyor shutoff and head outside and get dropped off this conveyor chute. If you're not, that means you still have heat to give to the power system. So it bypasses the conveyor shutoff and circles all the way back around 
starting here. So why the 15 units? Well, 15 is not actually the number we're looking for. It all starts with the minor volcano. You can see here that the average output that this volcano will produce always is 534 grams per second, or a half a kilo. Well, when you multiply a half a kilo times 600 seconds, you're given a figure of 300 kilos per cycle of beautiful magma. Now, the units themselves seem to translate to kilograms. So what we want is only 300 kilograms per cycle to pass through these rails. And that way we know we always have an available supply of igneous rock to use. So we actually make this 300 units per cycle. And why is it per cycle? The automation on the conveyor meter counts up to 300. Once it hits that, it's gonna send a green signal over to here to a knot gate. The knot gate flips it over to red and says, hey, turn off the conveyor shutoff. As soon as it reaches 300 units, it turns off the conveyor shutoff, which will not allow any more igneous rock through. Until this timer, once per cycle, sends a green signal to the reset switch. As soon as the reset switch goes, it resets the whole system and will allow 300 more kilos to pass through. Over here, we have a similar system. Once per cycle, we're going to flicker this door open. When it does, magma gets pushed into the mess tile, drops down here to where the auto sweepers can then pick it up. The auto sweepers are no longer connected to any sort of automation. The flow control is being managed by this conveyor meter and the supply is being managed by this timer sensor. Well, on top of this thermo sensor as well. Now that I'm done with my experimenting, we can set it back to say, if the temperature is below 140. Because basically what this is gonna say is don't open the door if it's still warm enough in here. And if it's still warm enough in here, that means there's still igneous rock on the rails. And here's how the system looks like when it's actually running. The one adjustment I had to make to make sure that the conveyor loaders would not try to put igneous rock on the line, if there was already stuff on the line, is just to bridge it on. You can see here some of the hot igneous rock is coming around for another loop, and this conveyor loader is not allowed to put anything onto the rail because it's being bridged on. What else have we been working on? Well, we're trying to reclaim some of our dirt. All of these planter boxes are made out of 100 kilos worth of dirt. We have clay now, which means we can build the planter boxes out of clay. So what we've been doing as the millwood is harvested, we take away the dirt planter boxes and put clay planter boxes. And each time we do that, we're able to feed another mealwood for 10 cycles. Hopefully by then our Paku farm will be up to snuff. Right now we're only sitting at 37 critters and it's gonna take a lot more fish to feed this colony. And the last thing to really show you as far as updates around the colony is, well, we're at 81 dupes, which means it's time to build another mega spawn. Once again, this is not a light project. It's definitely taking a lot of resources. Resources we have right now, Temporarily speaking, we're going to be supplying it using this saltwater geyser. We've been saving up quite a bit of salt water, transporting all that salt water in insulated liquid pipes all the way to Mega Spawn 2. We're also going to be tapping into this giant water pool soon because our main tank is definitely getting a little thin. So that's about it for today's episode. I know it was sort of a hodgepodge of smaller things, getting our power steam room up to snuff, and, well, more exploits and trying to make sure to feed and provide oxygen for all of these duplicates. I had a good time recording this episode. I hope you have a good time watching it, and I'll talk to you soon.